Now, if there ever was a movie that spoke to the heart of our church, I think this would be it um, for a couple of reasons. So I want to talk in three main buckets this morning. Some of the things that we can glean from the movie. Um, when we think about the young man whose name was Greg, um, obviously from the previous week, and if you think about it till today, there were a few things that factored into, you obviously know the moment where he came to Christ, right? Talk to me. Do you remember where he came to Christ? Come on, when was this? When? At the pool, right? At the, at the beach, right? Right, at the beach. Right, and a few things factored in here. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bring something out there so we just observe that. Number one was the mess that was going on in his life. Okay? Um, number two was the question you, you could see, and I think Pastor Toby talked about that last week, um, that there was a longing in his heart. There was a question in his heart that was not getting answered by the drugs, the partying, the fun, all right? So the mess in his life, his mom, his dad that left and all that, um, he's not belonging anywhere. Number two was the question in his heart about truth. The third thing was his encounter, a short encounter with this guy called Lani, right? Remember that night he was running and he met with Lani on the street? Um, that moment was a pivotal moment. Number four was his girlfriend, who was also new um, to the faith, as it were, who was also seeking or searching with him, and her extending an invitation to him to come with her. And of course, the last thing was just the atmosphere that was in that church. The point I'm trying to make is that sometimes you don't know the things that God takes together to make up the soup that leads to a person's salvation. Amen? Um, and so we can never despise anything in the life of a person. People are really seeking for God. Doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, the thing that you see in people that makes you think, oh God, these people are far away from God, is the very thing that God is going to use to bring them to himself. Do you understand that? And, and I think, I want to leave you with a responsibility in line with this particular one, is that you should never underestimate the power of a moment. Because that moment of encounter that he had with Lani on the side of the street, on the floor that night, was a life-changing moment for him. Just a couple of sentences that Lani spoke to him changed everything for him. It stayed with him. All right? And so don't ever, as children of God, as people who follow Jesus, some of us, maybe not all, but some of us, don't ever underestimate the power of a moment. Don't ever underestimate the power of a moment where a, a co-worker tells you about all the stuff they're going through, and you seize that moment to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You seize that moment to tell them, why don't you come with me to church? You seize that moment to tell them, why don't I pray with you? Those little things go a long way. All you can do, the Bible says that Paul plants Apollo's waters. It is God that gives the increase. So don't assume that just because you, you, know, you sowed a seed of salvation or faith in someone's heart and they did not fall down on their knees and say, I accept Jesus, that you have failed. No, you never know how far the seed that you have sown in the lives of people is going to, is going to go. Can I hear an amen to that one? Amen. So my admonition on this first part is do not ever underestimate the power of a moment. Good moments, bad moments, every moment. If you are looking for an opportunity to share the gospel, you will find it in every moment. You will find it in every moment. You will find it in everything. You will find it everywhere. So please don't underestimate. There are things going on in people's lives that would come together to make it make sense. And so the good news of the gospel is to be shared, is to be, is to be preached to anyone and everyone who would dare to listen to you. Amen? Amen? So I'll leave you with some action items on this one. Number one is please pray for the lost. If you're not praying for the lost, you will not see these opportunities. Pray for the lost. The lost in your family, your friends, even those that you don't know, just have a heart that reaches out to people who don't know Jesus. So it reaches out to people who don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Pray for them. Um, second thing you should do is you should think about someone in your space, in your orbit that you can influence for Christ. You have influence with certain people. Now, you might not be able to go to um, Britannia Beach and start baptizing people and start, <laughs> amen, and start preaching the gospel to people, but there are people within your space that you can influence. Like his girlfriend played a huge role. A huge role. Just saying, come with me. Some of you right now, there are some guys who are trying to talk to you. They don't know Jesus. You just forget about your future married life first. Think about this, the soul of that person. Are you hearing me? Some of you are like, no, 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 pastor. You have gotten the order wrong. I will marry them, then I will save their souls. You will be surprised. 
that you will not save anyone's souls. If you, if you think about, hmm, hmm, maybe God is trying to get this person saved. Now he can come to church and decide he's not interested in, in, your, <laughs> in you anymore. Don't be bitter at God, okay? You have gained something because you brought a soul to the kingdom. Do you understand? Use any influence you have, any influence you have to bring people to Jesus. Prayerfully bring people to Jesus. All right? Um, and of course, we talked about this last week, is just please as a house and as a person who's, an, who's a believer, if you are a believer, be welcoming of unbelievers. Be welcoming of what? Of unbelievers. Don't be too comfortable around believers that there is no space for other believers. Like we say in this house, maybe amongst our leadership team or amongst our dream team, is that there's room for you and you can sit with us. You can sit with us. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, I want to jump to the second thing I want to talk about. Um, and this one has to do with the power of community. Someone say the power of community. You realize that as soon as this guy gave his heart to Christ, he was thrust into community. He was living with ra- raccoons, <laughs> dead raccoons, and other believers. And this is one of, you know, when we read the Bible, please never despise the, the purest form of Christianity, of apostolic Christianity that we ever find was what the early church had, the purest it's ever been. You would see the importance of community. The Bible says that they would dwell together in one accord. The Bible will say several times that the disciples were of one heart and of one mind. They were doing life together. They were living together. They were meeting together in homes daily. Daily they were meeting together in homes. So you couldn't be a believer, all right, that was out of community. It just didn't work. And Jesus, you see, never, don't, don't despise the wisdom of God. When Jesus picked his disciples, these guys left what they were doing and followed him. They lived with him. They stayed with him. That's why they would have questions. They would observe his life and they would say, wait, 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 why do you do this? And he would teach them. There are certain things that you will never learn unless you're in community. So the idea of church that we have, where we show up on Sundays, you hear a 45 or 43 and a half minute sermon, and then that's the next, the last, next time you hear another sermon is the next week. You haven't spoken to any believer during the week. You haven't prayed with another person during the week. You haven't met with someone else who's a born-again Christian during the week. It's not enough to strengthen you in your Christian journey. It is absolutely not enough. Jesus took these guys, uprooted the 12, and they lived with him. And that's why there was a huge difference between what their lives produced and the multitudes that just came and left. Are you, do you understand that? The multitude came and left, came and left, but the 12, they were with him constantly, day and night. That is the job of discipleship. Of what? Of discipleship. So Greg gives his heart to Christ, and he's immediately thrown into a body of believers. They eat together. They do life together. They buy him a car that is cursed. Amen? Amen? (laughs) But they help him either way. The, The community is not just spiritual. It's practical support. Physical support, it's emotional support, and it's spiritual support. It's spiritual. But, you know, in the 21st century, it's just me and my Jesus. I'm just, just me. I'll just, you know, I'm not, listen to me. That Christianity does not work. It does not work. I want to read some scriptures to you. Um, Acts chapter 4. There are quite a number of scriptures we can read on community, but I like these particular two scriptures. Acts chapter 4 from verse 18. From verse 18, NKJV. The Bible says, so they call them. Now, the story here is that Peter and John um, had healed a man who was born lame at the gate called Beautiful. And they were being persecuted for healing this man and for preaching in the name of Jesus. So the Bible says they call them. They is the council, the ruling council. And them is Peter and John. And commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. So they're threatening them. Please pay attention. They are threatening the two of them. Never again should you speak in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. He says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen or heard. So obviously they are preaching the gospel. Verse 21 is important. He says, so when they had further threatened them, they did what? They let them go. Let's jump to verse 23 for time. Thank you. Now it says, and being let go, what did they do? They went to who? Their own companions. Another translation says their own company. 
And the translation says their own people. Do you have people? When the enemy threatens your life, do you have people? This is Peter and John, by the way. These guys were two of three that were on the mountain with Jesus when he was transfigured. They are leading apostles. The Bible says when they were threatened, they didn't go home. They went to where? Their own companions. Who are your companions? And they reported the issue. It says, look, I've just gotten this report from work. I've just been fired. Oh, my wife and I have been fighting for the past three weeks. They re- are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? They reported the issues to their people. And the Bible says... All, they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. 24, it says, so when they heard, they is the people, their companions, their friends, their community, they raised their voice to God. How? With one accord. And they prayed about this issue. They prayed about this issue. Skip on long prayer and all that. Verse number 31. The Bible says 31. 3, one. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Who was filled with the Holy Spirit? All. And that's one of the benefits of community, is that the the least amongst us becomes the strongest amongst us. That the weak ones amongst us become as strong as the strongest, because all of them, no one was, now we don't know if all of them knew how to pray, we don't know if their syntax was aligned, but the fact that they were part of that community, I don't know how many there were here, but everybody partook of the blessings of that prayer. Everyone partook. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth. In Acts chapter 12, another scripture on community, when Peter, again, Peter was always in trouble, was arrested. The Bible says he was arrested by Herod. Acts chapter 12 from verse 1. The intention of Herod was that he was going to bring Peter out to kill him after the festival. Please, I want you to understand this. In this dark hour of Peter's life, even though Peter was a leader in the church, the leader, not even a leader, the leader in the church, he was too weak to pray for himself. I need that to sink in very well. Because if Peter got to a point in his life where he was too weak to pray, you will get there. You will. The Bible says, please, can you keep going to the place I'm looking for? Amen, Brother Greg. Amen? Peter was sleeping. That's what I'm looking for, sleeping. Between... Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible says Peter was therefore kept in prison. Um, Go to verse 6. I'll come back to verse 5 in a moment. The Bible says, when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, somebody said that night, Peter was what? Sleeping. Now, you would think he would be having a night vigil. He was weary. He was tired. He was exhausted spiritually. He was sleeping. He said, look, God, if I meet my maker, I'm ready to meet my maker. The Bible says, go back to verse 5, please, though, that but constant prayer was offered to God for him by who? The church. The church. The man who was the most anointed amongst them, who just raised a guy that was 40 years lame at his feet, was too tired to pray. But his community came to his rescue. Let me just tell you this. If you don't have what we just read in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 12, you don't have community. Uh, Let me just say that again. The, The fact that you come to church does not mean you're in community. If you don't have people you can call and say, this is what is happening, and they will pray from their heart for you until that issue shifts. You don't have a community. You don't have a community. And that's a dangerous place to be as a Christian. God has designed it. The Bible says two are better than one. Okay, it says that when one falls, not if, when he falls, he has another to lift him up. Who will lift you up? Who will lift you up? Who, do you have people you can vouch for that, look, if I tell them what's going on in my life, they can do a seven-day fast on my behalf, and you can trust that they're fasting because there is a strength of community that you have. I'm not saying, oh, I just say, it's just me and my husband and Jesus. Listen to me. <laughs> you, you and your husband are one. The things you are going through, your husband is going through. I hear what I'm saying. Hmm. You're supposed to be where? In community. 
in community. So what does community do for a believer? Number one, it's a spiritual growth system. It establishes you in the faith. There are many things that you would only learn by asking questions. There are many things you would only learn by interacting with other believers. Your growth will be stunted if you're not in community. Now, you can grow. I'm just telling you that it will not be the same. It will absolutely not be the same. There are many things you would only see in Scripture by discussing it with other believers. You hear me? Are you hearing me, guys? Yeah. What does community do for you? It's also a spiritual accountability system. If you don't have transparency, if you claim to be in community, and all you can do with the people that are in community with you is pray, and you cannot tell them the truth about what's going on in your life, you don't have community. Meaning you cannot tell them, by the way, I've been looking at certain websites I should not be looking at. Glory. Amen? You don't have community. There is transparency and accountability in community. There is. Use that scripture a few weeks ago, John, James chapter 5 from verse 16. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. There are certain things you must be able to confess to people. I said, I'm struggling in my life. This is happening in my life. This is going on with me. Pray with me. So if you have community today and you're hiding the things you're going on from your, that's going on in your life from your community, you don't have community. You don't. It is transparent. The Bible says they reported the issue. If it was a modern-day pastor, he would keep the threats to himself. Say, I don't want the congregation to know. But that's not community. They brought the issues. Look, this is the threat. This is what we are going through. A threat against one is a threat against everyone. And they prayed, and they prayed, and God's hand was moved. Amen? Amen. Number three, community is a spiritual support system. So like I said, apart from physical support and emotional support, it's also a spiritual support system. Number four, it's a spiritual defense system. If you read the Bible, and if you look and observe in nature, it's always the lone sheep that gets attacked by wolves. Are you? Are you with me? It's always what? The lone sheep that gets attacked by wolves. Even, no matter how weak you are, if you are in the midst of the bunch, you are safe. Now, if you are the strongest of the strongest, but you are isolated, you'll be the target. Did you hear what I said? No matter, if you're weak, but you're in community, you'll be safe. If you are strong, but you are separated from community, you are a target. You're a target. No one Christian has what it takes to stand alone against the enemy. Not one. It doesn't matter if you pray from morning to night. It doesn't matter if you pray all night till the next day. Not one. But in community, there is safety. The last thing about community is that it's our spiritual pollination system. There is a transference and a cross-pollination of giftings and abilities. There are many things that you will not catch unless you're in community. There are a lot of things, spiritual things are caught by proximity. So if I have a spiritual gift and we're in community together, you're going to start to see that spiritual gift operate in the lives of people who hang around me. And I will start to catch the spiritual gifts that are operating in your life. That's how God designed for the body of Christ to be strengthened. Are you tracking with me? So if you say, no, I'll just go to heaven, I'll pray for 40 days and 40 nights. There'll be an impartation. Jesus would appear to me. Thank God. Even if Jesus appears to you, everything you need, you will not get from Jesus directly. There are some things you would only get from being in close proximity with other believers. So ask your neighbor, who's your company? Hmm? Who are you hanging out with? <laughs> community is practical, please. I'm not saying you come to church. Coming to church is not the same as community because we don't know you like that. <laughs> I'm just telling you. We don't know you like that. We don't know what's going on in your life. We don't know if you have something under your bed that you bring... <laughs> <laughs> are you hearing me? We don't know you like that. Community is the people that you do life together. You're eating together. You're spending time together. You're hanging out together. They see you. You see them. There is transparency and accountability. And you are praying together. Now, if you're not doing life together, doing life means you're not eating, hanging out together, you're not in community. Number two, these three things must be present. Transparency and accountability. Number three is that you are praying together and you're praying for each other. If you're only praying together, it doesn't mean you're in community. So just because you have a prayer team and we all pray together for the church, it doesn't mean you're in community. Who is praying for you? Are you tracking with me? Okay. Hmm. Um, let me say this on community before I leave here, because I think it's important. that Let's take a church, a local church like this, for example. This is an example of a local church. Within the local church, obviously, you need to find your tribe just like Greg. He found his artistic people. Are you, are you hearing me? The creatives always find themselves. Hey, man, they're always weird. <laughs> but 
I'm just hating on them, sorry, because I don't have any talent in that area. They are weird. My own people are, it's only Bible we know. <laughs> but listen, huh. let me take it, uh, church as an example. There is, for example, there are certain things that if you are observant, if you are observant, um, and I know some of you are guests, so welcome to Lighthouse Church. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I serve on the teaching team. Amen. My name is Uluwayeni. Amen. Now, listen, you, if you've observed certain things, you know that in our house, there are certain things that God has blessed us with as a grace. I'm just, let me just give you an example. For example, one of the things that God has blessed our house with um, is wisdom. The ability to solve complicated issues simply. I'm talking about our church as an organization. It's one of the things God has given us. One of the things God has given us is the grace for increase. We've all, if you come to this church six months from today, we will never be the same. It's just, it has never happened. Are you understanding that? It's a grace. I don't, it's not because of fasting and prayer. God has given us that. What I'm trying to say to you is this. When you're truly plugged into a community, the grace that manifests in that community must manifest in your life. So, if you happen to be plugged into a community and you don't see the grace that is manifest in that community in your life, it means you're not truly plugged in. It means that your heart is not connected, even though you are physically present. Because you can get into a house, you can have a bunch of electronics and nothing is plugged into the wall. Presence does not mean connection, is what I'm trying to tell you. There is a connection of the heart. There is a way you speak, and we know. I, was, I saw something over the week. It just happened to have, um, it was Bishop David Oedeko was speaking about how. Sometimes people talk about their church and say um, they are doing this program or they are building a, a sanctuary. The fact that you can say they are tells you that you're not connected. Do you understand that? You don't have a sense of ownership. So there is a way your heart plugs into the people that are, you're in community with that allows you to feed from the grace. So if you find yourself in community and you think you're still struggling, I think you should examine that your heart is really connected to the people. And connection has to do with, like I said, how you, um, how you give into that, how you pour into, let me use that term, pour into that group. You're praying for the people. You're really praying for them. You sincerely love them. You're praying for them when there's a need in their lives. If you can meet the need, you meet the need. And you're not expecting anything in return. That is a true connection. And what God is going to do is that God is going to use that same community to be a blessing to you. Amen? Amen? Please be planted in community. It's very important. You know, a couple of weeks ago, um, one of our beloved sisters in church had a surgery. Because <laughs> you see, sometimes you think that everything is be healed in Jesus' name. We do that, and God, thank God, God is faithful to us in that area. Amen? But this person had to go through surgery. We did healing, be healed, be healed. We cast and bound. We, but the surgery had to happen. But after the surgery was happening, this person had to go move into church members' house so that they can take care of her. That's community. Do you have that in your life? Or they'll need to hang your leg in the hospital for two weeks because you have no one. I have no one like that man at the pool said, I have no one. How can you have no one? How can you be 38 years old and have no one? The Bible says he that wants friends must show himself what? Friendly. Friendly. So plug in. Plug in. There's danger in community, by the way. But the benefits outweigh the risks. So don't say people. I can't do people. I can't. Listen to me. You will need people there. Eh? You will definitely need people. Amen. Last time I talk about is baptism. Somebody say Baptism. Woo. Now, listen to me, please. Listen to me very carefully. Very, very carefully. I'm about to speak on baptism in the next five minutes and change in a way that I haven't spoken on baptism before. Because I want you to understand, I don't think I've ever done a teaching on baptism. Please never assume that there is anything casual about water baptism. Please listen to me very well. Water baptism is not a casual thing. It's not just something we do because we are now Christians. It's not a powerless sacrament, as it were, of our faith. If you go back to the early church, like I said, you would realize the commitment that they had to baptizing believers in water. So Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Let's put it all together, both of it together. Put it all together. 15 and 16. Amen. Amen. Okay, you want me to go one after the other? Okay, that's fine. That's that. He said to them, he's Jesus, by the way, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 16. 
He who believes and is what? Baptized will be saved. This is Jesus speaking. Please don't be more Catholic than the Pope. Don't come with a New Testament theology that is not balanced. Jesus is the one talking here. Believes and is baptized will be saved. However, he says this. This is the balance. He who does not believe will be what? Condemned. So the fact that you're not baptized does not mean you'll be condemned. Are you hearing me? It is believing that, that not believing that makes you condemned. However, when Jesus talks about being saved, he says the two go what? Together. Believed and, is, and th that is the order, by the way. That's why when Greg got to the water, they asked him, have you believed? He says, uh, I don't know. They're like, whoa. There's no point going into this water if you have not believed. So he says, okay, I believe, you know, confesses sins and all that stuff, um, what we call the sinner's prayer. And then he's baptized. So for those of you that were baptized before you believed, please, read the scriptures. It is not scriptural. And I don't, I don't mean, I do not, honestly do not mean to demean whatever denominational backgrounds you have. But there's nowhere in the New Testament that you see children baptized. You have to come to the age of accountability where you have decided for Jesus. Then you decide to be baptized. Nowhere in the New Testament do I see a baby pew, tossed into water. Glory to God. Are you hearing me? He that believes and is baptized. So the early church focused on this. Once they came into any body of believers, the first question they would ask them is, are you saved? Yes. Number two, have you been baptized in water? If they say no, they're going to put them in water. The third thing is, have you received the Holy Spirit? The three things. That's it. Sometimes people got the Holy Spirit, okay, before getting baptized in water, like in the book of Acts chapter 10, the house of Cornelius. Peter was still preaching, and the Holy Spirit came, and they started speaking in tongues. Peter says, okay, fantastic. I'm happy that you're now speaking in tongues. He says, now, can we, Acts chapter 10, from verse 47 there about, he says, let us bring water so that these can now be baptized. And they baptize them in water. There is nothing casual about baptism. There is, it's just like an anointing oil, for, for example. The, water, the, the oil is ordinary, just like the water is ordinary. I mean, pe all kinds of people swim at the beach, I, I would assume, or go into water. But once there is faith and proper understanding in what you're doing, the Bible says that if any one of you is sick, let the elders anoint him with oil. The moment you have that understanding, that oil is no longer ordinary. The same way you have the right understanding of baptism, the water is no longer ordinary. So as much as we say that baptism is so that you can have a public identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, let me tell you something, that there are certain things in your life that can shift as a result of baptism. Every time I do baptisms and I spend time praying for the people who are to be baptized, God gives me you know, either things that I see about certain people's lives that are being shifted because of baptism. Someone was to be baptized here the other day, and you know, the night before the baptism, she had an encounter, a demonic encounter, where you know, some demonic spirit appeared to her and said, so you want to leave us. So if it is a casual thing, if it is a casual thing, why would that happen? There is nothing casual about it. And by the way, please hear me very well. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about how the blood was shed. And so as a result of the blood that was shed in Egypt, the people were saved from Egypt. Do you remember that story? Talk to me. Do you remember the story? Yeah. Remember the story? The blood was shed. A lamb was killed. The blood was put on the doorpost and the lintels and all that. And the Bible says that by that blood, they were brought out of Egypt. So that's like salvation. That's like what? Salvation you realize that even though they were saved, technically, uh, Pharaoh still came after them. Do you remember that? The only thing that took care of Pharaoh was what? The waters. And the, the going through the Red Sea is symbolic of baptism in the New Testament. So I'm telling you that some people come to Christ, and I've seen people who came to Christ, and there were miracles that happened at the point of decision. Certain things left their lives. I've seen people who carried certain things with them to the waters of baptism, and those things left their lives. So don't ever take it for granted that, oh, I'm just going into water. No. If you came to Christ with an addiction, if you go to the, with the right mentality to the waters of baptism, that thing can leave you there. It can drop in that water because the symbolism is that the old man dies and the new man is, is, is brought out of the water. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not casual. It's not casual. If done properly with the right understanding 
Addictions can leave you besetting sin. Some people say, I've been born again for five years. I just can't shake this sin. I doubt how you got baptized. Because if you read Romans chapter 6, you can put that up as I close. Romans chapter 6, you would see the... You would see the... Um, <laughs> you would see how... Paul speaks about baptism, you know, Romans 6 from verse 1, he starts out by saying that, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Keep going. He says, certainly not. How shall we, 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 who died to sin, live any longer in it? He says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, even we also should walk in what? Newness of life. So there are certain things that you leave in the waters of baptism. I promise you. So I'm talking to our, our leaders as well. As we go to baptism, it's not casual. We'll pray fully that anyone who I dip in this water, if there's anything that is not of God in your life, let it remain in that water. And let the person who emerges from that water be someone who emerges to what? Newness of life life. Now, on your journey with Christ, I'm not saying that the enemy will not come after you or there won't be challenges on your journey like you saw them in the wilderness. However, the things you brought into salvation must die in that water. Say amen to that. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. Please don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. I know of baptisms where as people were put in the water, they were all slain in the spirit. I know of baptisms where people were put in the water, they came out filled with the Holy Ghost. No one prayed for them. I you know of baptisms where you put them in the water and demons leave them. So it's not casual. So Baptism Sunday is coming up. When? This month? Next month? This month? When? Next Sunday? Next Sunday. Glory. Glory. So please, go and sign up for baptism. If you're baptized as a child, please make a decision now with understanding. The things in your life you don't want, pray you fully approach the water. And I trust that God would visit you in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that God will visit you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shut your eyes for two seconds. Let's give an opportunity to someone here to make a decision. One of the things that Laurie has um, asked Greg at the water, he says, do you want to decide now? For, the, for many of you or some of you here, um, maybe at Carlton, maybe physically in this room, maybe online or something, you've never really made a decision. So your life obviously is going to be a function of the decisions you make. The most decision you would ever make is a decision to follow Jesus, to surrender your heart to him. And you want to say, hmm, Pastor, I thought you never asked. Today is my day. I want to make a decision. Wherever you are in the room, just wave your hand at me so I can see you and we can pray together. That's why we're here. If there's anyone at all, wave your hands up high. Don't be ashamed about it. And we would pray with you. Any decisions? You're making a decision for Jesus today. You're saying, I submit my heart to you. I surrender to you. I want to stop running. I want to stop running. God bless you. I see you. Thank you. God, I appreciate your boldness. I want to stop. God bless you, bro. I see you too. I want to stop running. If you're at Carlton, raise your hand up high. Jesus sees you. The ushers will get to you over there, wherever you are. I want to stop running. I decide today. Your life is going to be a function of the decisions you make. Is there anyone else in the room that wants to join those who have just raised their hand? Jesus sees you. It's not a casual thing. Also, your life will never remain the same. I can promise you that. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father. I give you praise. I give you thanks. For those two in the room, for those at Carlton, those online at home, just take two, you know, a few seconds to talk to the Lord and just say, Father, I, I've come to you. I, I dropped myself at the foot of the cross this morning. I yield myself to you. I submit my heart to you. Ask that the Lord forgives your sins. Acknowledge the saving grace that is in the person of Jesus Christ, that he died for you that he went to the cross, that he was buried, and that he rose on the third day for you, for you, for you, for you, so you can appropriate all that he has done. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As a church, as a house, can we just say the prayer together as we encourage our brothers and sisters? Can we say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. We believe that you died for our sins. We believe that you rose again on the third day. I believe that all my sins have been paid for by your precious blood. From this day, I submit myself to you. I surrender my life to you. Give me the grace to live my life 
in a way that is pleasing to you. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Become Lord of my life from this day forward. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Order my steps. Guide my path from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your precious ones. I ask in the name of Jesus that there will be a very real encounter with your spirit. And as you draw them closer, let the reality of your love, let it flood their hearts, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Reveal yourself to them in an unusual way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God for those precious people? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. For those two, and for those online, those at Carlton as well, um, you were given cards, so please do fill out the cards. And of course, there is also a QR code on the screen behind me. You can scan that QR code so you can take your next steps. The best next step you can take is to get baptized next Sunday. Amazing timing. Amen. And then, of course, join the New Believers Connect group and all that stuff. God bless you as you do that in Jesus' name. God bless you as you do that in Jesus' name. As you go this week, think about someone, pray for someone, and please speak to someone about Jesus. Amen. If you cannot speak to someone about Jesus, invite them to church. We will talk to them about Jesus. Amen. Amen. And as you go, God bless you. We love you. See you next week. Amen.